Uh, go out, go ahead and get your eye clickers out, get those turned on. So as I said before, we're going to start each each lecture with two questions. Um, also, we're going to be doing some calculate no, math, yeah, some simple calculations today. If you need it as a crutch or whatever, feel free. You can use a calculator or calculator built into your phone. You won't be able to use this for the exam, but during the lectures, that'll be fine. Uh, did the eye clickers ever come in? They're available in the bookstore now. Okay, good. All right, so just to kind of refresh things, and what I'm doing a little differently in terms of the extra credit is there's ten, a maximum of 10 points available for these eye clicker questions. About 40% of those points are actually going to be from participation, which means you must answer all the questions from the beginning to the end. So we're going to start off with two questions. One based on the previous lecture and one based on the material that's scheduled to be covered today. This is there to prompt you to do a little preparation before you come to class. Uh, then there will be eye clicker questions throughout, and I usually end the session with, with an eye clicker question. So if you come in late, you miss the first question, you're not going to get the participation point. So the way it's going to work is it's 20 points for participation. That is, answer all the questions wrong, you still get the 20 points. These first two questions are also high-value targets in the current political jargon in that they're each worth 10 points. So you're really going to have about 80% of the eye clicker points within about the first five minutes of class. The rest of the questions and the number will vary depending on how Diana and I decide to put them in there will vary from maybe five or six per, per lecture, but there'll be two points each. All right. The other is... I didn't believe it at first, but I think there really is value in peer-to-peer in -peer interaction. So during the first two questions, you're on your own. You're not to talk to the person sitting next to you or behind you. But when we get into the other questions, then as long as we keep it under reasonable, reasonably low chaos, some sort of organized chaos, you can talk to each other because those questions are really there for the purposes of learning. Let's see how this is going to work out. I'm sorry, what? All right, yeah, let me, okay. You want to register on Blackboard. And I think I sent a link out for registering them. Whether you're registered or not, it doesn't matter. You can use them today if you used them in the previous lecture. All that data is recorded based on the serial number that's on the iClicker. All registration does is links your name to that serial number. But yes, go through the Blackboard website. I think if you go through the iClicker, there may actually even be a fee associated with it now. So just go through the Blackboard website. I can start looking at the registration now that enrollment is over, and I can't link your iClicker to your name until there's at least one response in the database. Okay? So any other general clicker questions? Everybody's set on the right frequency. Do you know how it works? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. It says you can do multiple ones, but I think it's only going to do one at a time. Okay. So what I'm going to be able to do is put together a printout. I'm going to be putting up some pins for you shortly so I can keep these anonymous. You'll see what I have registered. I can manually enter two serial numbers if you've got if you've used two different clickers in this class. Okay, so we can... Yeah, once you see on the list, then you can just email me and I can put it in manually. Okay. So here's the first question. Uh, having to do with meiosis that we talked about last time. So which statement about statement or statements is or are false about meiosis? So again, these first two questions, you work on these yourself. We'll go for about one minute. Okay. 
Okay, five seconds. All right, so what's the answer? Um, oh. All right. The second one, straightforward one about what we're going to talk about today. What was the first genetic model organism? If you missed this one, you might as well just leave at this point. One of those you may not even have heard of yet. Yeah, I think we only need 45 seconds on that one. Okay, that's obviously what? P plant. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about Mendel's work. You've heard about this before. You've heard about it in high school. You've heard about it in general biology. There's a couple of goals I, I want for today. That is one is by the time we get done with this, at least you walk out of here going, yeah, I think I understand this Mendelian genetics rather than, yeah, I remember some of the words and the terms, but I don't really understand it. Two, to recognize that the two fundamental rules or laws that Mendel gave us, the laws of independent um, segregation and independent assortment, really are rooted in the behavior of the chromosomes. So to be able to link to what we learned about meiosis uh, in the last lecture to the outcome that Mendel really saw. Now, he came to these conclusions correctly without knowing anything about what was happening inside the cell. All right. Um, the third is there are, are going to be, obviously, there are going to be questions about Mendelian genetics on the first exam. I would hope that by the time you get done with the lecture today, you can answer all of those questions without drawing the first Punnett square in the margins of your exam. Okay, So we're ultimately, normally, you've probably crossed, talked about monohybrid crosses where one gene is involved, dihybrid crosses where there's two genes involved. Because I'm just a little bit crazy, we're going to work some problems, a pentahybrid cross where there's five genes involved. And I'm going to show you that applying a couple of math probability rules makes this much easier than dealing with a Punnett square. And fourth, try to give you a little bit of an idea of just how important luck is when it comes to scientific investigation. And there were lots of things that were working in Mendel's favor. When we get to chapter five, a fairly complex chapter that talks a, a lot of cases about non-Mendelian inheritance, doesn't defy the rules that Mendel laid out, but the phenotypes are more complicated. And somehow Mendel didn't run into any of those stumbling blocks in his work. So that's kind of what hopefully achieved today. All right. So I put a few dates up here. I'll use dates throughout the course. You don't have to memorize the dates. I think it's good that you have some general idea of, of these times because sometimes what we thought at that particular time made sense based on what was known. But then we had to change those ideas a little bit later. Um, also to show a little bit of a gap here. So Mendel's finally got his work published in the late 1800s. He died about uh, 20 years, not quite 20 years later. But for a number of reasons, possibly because he wasn't formally trained as a scientist, but rather he was a monk. And people just didn't understand what he was trying to show here, his work was really unappreciated for several decades. Then it was almost simultaneously rediscovered by a couple of labs, including Morgan's lab, who started using Drosophila as a genetic model system in the early uh, part of the 1900s. So we'll get to that one a little bit later. But the main point here is that his work, the importance of his work was really unrecognized for several decades. So this is the organism he works with. It's a, we'll just simply call it this pea plant. It had lots of the characteristics that you want for genetics, although he didn't really understand that at the time. But he had access to it. He had some experience with these plants. He had a greenhouse. They have 
you know, relatively speaking, a fairly rapid generation time, one generation per growing season. Uh, you could never get tenure today if you had to wait that long between generations. It's bad enough with fruit flies having to wait about 10 days between generations. You wanted lots of progeny, lots of offspring, whatever you want to call them, so you could do some statistics on it, or in his case, his application of really a quantitative approach to his experiments. He also had to have a large number of varieties. If he couldn't see different phenotypes, different varieties, he really couldn't do these experiments. So obviously Mendel wasn't the first person to recognize that children look like their parents or animals look like their parents or plants look like their offspring or whatever. But he did it in a very quantitative way. And he was very careful and meticulous in his notes and his quantitation, applied some very basic math to the problem, and came to some very important conclusions, again, without understanding what was really happening inside the cells. So he looked at these seven traits, the position of the flower, the color of the pod, the shape of the pod, the length of the stem, and the color of the endosperm and the seed coat and the shape of the seed. So he had these seven traits. I guess I'll say it now, but it's going to be, I'll repeat it because it's really, really important. Here's where luck came in. The only reason he saw the results that he did is because the genes that control each of these traits are on a different chromosome. If the genes had been on the same chromosome, he would have seen what we call linkage. And we'll talk about this later on. Well, to make it even more lucky, it only, there's only seven sets of chromosomes in the pea plant. So he was lucky enough to choose traits that were controlled by a gene where each trait was on a different chromosome. All right. So just to review and re-familiarize you with a little bit of the terminology that we have to use for genetics. First of all, how we define a gene is going to keep changing shape as we go through the semester. So it started out, I mean, Mendel just thought it was this factor. He didn't really know what it was. As we come into molecular terms, we're going to define it in a different way. So we'll keep changing and making our definition of a gene more specific as we go. Um, but for right now, we'll just say it's some factor that controls an inheritable trait. As you already know, alleles are simply different versions of that gene. That is, these genes are encoded in DNA sequences. The alleles have different DNA sequences. They, do they always, does changing the allele always change the phenotype? Not always. In fact, many of the changes have no effects at all. Mendel kept it simple. He only was dealing with two alleles for each of the genes that he was looking at. Others could have been out there, but he just focused with only two alleles for each gene controlling each of those seven traits. The genetic locus, the locus is the address on the chromosome where that gene resides. So the locus is the specific place on the chromosome where the, the gene, which is the DNA sequence, actually resides. Since it's of Latin origin, loci is the plural form of it. And the genotype is really the set of the, all of the alleles that we're looking at. All right. And we only have two possibilities. Since there's only two alleles, we're dealing with diploid organisms. Two identical alleles, your homozygous. Doesn't matter whether it, which allele it is, dominant, recessive, we'll get into all that in a minute. If they're identical, it's homozygous. If they're different, it's heterozygous. Okay. Any questions on that? Most of this, again, should be very familiar. We're just trying to get everybody back to the same point. Okay. Here's where things aren't that clear. All right. The phenotype are those traits that we can quantify or observe, height, weight, color, some external measurement that we can make in some way. So that can be almost anything. But the genotype 
isn't always exactly equivalent to the phenotype. The genotype is going to place limits on what this phenotype can be, but as we'll get into more cases as we go through the semester, gene products, the proteins encoded by these genes can interact with each other. There's genetic interactions with the environment. There's things like epigenetic events and such. So sometimes you might have the same phenotype but have different genotypes. Sometimes you might have different genotypes but the same phenotype that comes out of it. I may have not gotten that reversed right. So the genotype is going to set limits, and we'll keep refining this as we go further into the course. But the phenotype is what we can actually observe in the laboratory, in the field, wherever we happen to be doing the work. So the genotype is what's inherited. This is it's really the genotype that's transmitted from generation to generation. But the, you cannot, in, you don't inherit a phenotype. It may sound like a subtle distinction, but it's very important. The other thing is changing technology. So the classical genetics that Mendel laid out, the classical genetics that was used with Drosophila and yeast and C. elegans and all these other model systems for so many decades going through the 1900s, until we really got to the molecular level of genetics, what they really did was were looking at the phenotype but had to infer the genotype. In other words, make a guess at what the genotype was. This is what we kind of in jargon now call forward genetics. Today a lot of our work is done by reverse genetics. We can find a gene that looks interesting because maybe its activity changes in tumor cells compared to normal cells, but we don't know what that gene codes for, so we're kind of working backwards. We can, now we can really start with the genotype and work backwards to the phenotype. So it's just changing technologies and changing and expanding our understanding of what's happening. Okay, so here's what you've seen. The monohybrid cross, classic Punnett square. We'll go through this. I'll show you, make sure you understand that. We'll do the dihybrid cross. Then I'll show you how you can cut through all of those drawing boxes and such and solve it, basically you should be able to work it in your head or just kind of scribbling in the margins with a, write out a couple of fractions. All right, a couple of important points, again, where Mendel got lucky. These pea plants are self-fertilizing. So when he crosses, if they will just breed between themselves to cross two different plants, he has to physically intervene and transfer the gametes from one plant to the other. All right. So the first thing is we're going to start with monohybrids. All that means is we're just going to start with one gene, the hybrid coming from the fact that the parents are going to be of two different genes or two different phenotypes. All right. The first generation in the classic kind of Mendelian crosses starts with the so-called P generation or the parental generation. So here's just a diagram showing that to actually cross the plants at the P generation, he had to physically transfer the pollen. And so why is this important? What would have happened if P plants were had, <laughs> this is why I show how little I know about plants. Let's say it was windborne pollen. Could he have done these experiments? Why? Yeah, you have no idea who the parents were in those crosses. So he had a nice genetic system here where he could also control the crosses and he knew with a high level of certainty who those parents were. Okay, We have to do something similar with Drosophila. In the jargon it's called collecting virgins, which I always thought was funny until I had a daughter. Okay, <laughs> And the whole idea is they're flies. You have to get the females within about the first, you have to isolate them within about the first couple of hours after they come out of the puparium, or your virgin flies are not virgins anymore. So uh, it's the same sort of thing. You have to control the mating so you know who the males are and who the females were. So that's why it worked, another reason why these pea plants worked really well for this study. All right. The F1 generation gets its name for the filial generation. So this is the cross. 
He started with what he called true breeding parents. What did he mean by that? Well, he had no idea what homozygous and heterozygous meant. What he really was looking at was, here's a, remember, there's self-fertilizing. So here's a plant which I've been carrying now for generation after generation after generation, and it always has yellow seeds. So it's true breeding. This one, generation after generation, had only green seeds, so it's true breeding. He was, yes, looking at homozygous individuals, he just didn't know it at that time. So by true breeding, it simply means if I self-breed this plant generation after generation after generation, I have the same phenotype. So all of these Mendelian crosses always start with these true breeding parents. Okay. Here's an important point, not for what we're talking about today, but when we talk about sex-linked inheritance next time. In all of his experiments, the reciprocal crosses gave the same result. What it simply means by that is, in this case, um, we'll just use male and female, even though they're plants. Okay? The male can have round seeds, the female wrinkled seeds, or you can reverse that. The male can have wrinkled seeds, the female have round seeds, and the outcome is the same. We now understand this is exactly what would happen with genes on the autosomes of the non-sex chromosomes. So Mendel didn't see any sex linkage, most likely because pea plants don't even have a true sex chromosome. If they had sex chromosomes and the gene that he was looking at was on, on, the X chromo on that sex chromosome, he would have gotten results that weren't consistent and he really couldn't explain them. Again, a little more luck involved. Okay. So here's the F1 generation, which is simply the cross between the two true breeding parents. All right. So what's the first thing you notice here about the phenotype? Are they different? They're all the same. Okay, so that's the first thing you notice. He, he has these parents with two different phenotypes. He crosses them, and only one phenotype comes out. Now, that's obviously what we're going to be calling as the dominant. But then if he takes those F1 plants and allows them to self-fertilize, so crosses to themselves, both traits that were present in the original generation come back again. And they come back in a very specific ratio. Three quarters had the had a, one of the traits that had the trait that was seen in the F1, and one fourth had the trait that was in, that was seen in one parent, but not in the F1. All right. So here's the actual data from his paper. So he, he counted all these seeds. Like I said, he was very quantitative, and so at the F2 generation. So these are self-crossing. He has three quarters round, one quarter wrinkled. What this told him was, he, again, he didn't know what these factors were, these genetic factors. But these factors, whatever they were, were discrete. They didn't blend together and get lost in that F1 generation because the one factor came back again at the second. Does that make sense? Everybody will go yell. All right. So these factors are being transmitted from one generation to the next as genetic, as discrete units. And since both parental traits were present in the F2, they, the F1 must have inherited both traits from the parents. Therefore, there must be two genetic factors that determine a specific phenotype. Is that consistent with what we know? Yes. He, can correct, he correctly concluded that each gene had two alleles. Okay. His second conclusion, one allele goes to each gamete. So there's two alleles. One's going to go to each gamete. That fertilization brings each of those alleles together from each parent to form the genotype of the offspring. All right. So this idea of dominant and recessive comes from Mendel's original work. 
The phenotype that came through on the F1 generation was referred to as dominant. And the one that disappeared in the F1 and reemerged in the F2 is called recessive. Now, as we get into the molecular side of this and we understand genetics in, a in much more detail, these definitions of dominant and recessive end up being modified a little bit. So we'll have to talk about that as we go. We're going to get into areas where you can't really apply these terms, but they're just, they come from Mendel's work. We've just had to modify them as we learn more about the system. Okay, so all this sound familiar? Okay, we're getting there. All right. So let's try this one. This is, I'm trying again, a text-based one. So let me s let's see if this works. We'll make it uh, here. Now, is that working? Can you? And then now I'll see how many different ways you spell this word. Yes. No, no, it's just, no, the, the spaces don't, it's just the way it came up. Yeah. No, it's not like a crossword puzzle. Is that exactly What's up? The same no. Oh. No, it's just the way, no, that's not the exact number of letters. No, it's just, that's the way it came up on the font. Yes. Oh, to put in the right? Yeah. Okay, that's an interesting idea. Well, it, to make it easier, actually put in the, since it's, there's possible and different variations, I can make it like a crossword puzzle and put in the number of spaces that match the word. I'm, it's not that you, it's not important that you put in the correct answer, it's important that you put in the one that I think is correct. Okay? All right. That was like a low-level hum in here. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Okay, so I know you didn't remember I'll have to use these kind of questions when I need a break. <laughs> Hmm? Uh, not one I can think of right away. One of the things I wanted to see is when I look at the results, what does it show me? It shows me all the different variations. It's going to show me all the misspelled words, that sort of thing. So if I see a second possibility that I hadn't thought about, I'll be able to give credit for it. We'll see what, what your idea is. All right. All right, we there. It looks like. Well, somebody's still Googling. <laughs> All right. Any questions as what we just. I obviously picked a word with too many letters in it. <laughs> Have to limit it to one syllable. All right, let's. So what do you think the answer is supposed to be? Uh, yes, okay. What was the second answer? Okay, yeah, I would take that. Like I said, that'll show up on the display. And, um, <laughs> okay, so I get extra credit for the shortest word, is that right? Well, it'll be interesting to see what other ideas come up. Okay, all right. So this really gives us Mendel's first law. There's just two. The diploid organisms have two alleles of each gene. One allele segregates to each gamete. That's what happens in meiosis. The alleles segregate, and this was important, alleles segregate into gametes into equal proportion. Is that necessarily obvious? I mean, what if biological systems had chosen some mechanism where gametes with the dominant allele survive better than ones with recessive allele could have happened. One of the things about biological research, at least has been my experience, is biological systems don't do things in necessarily the logical way that we think they might do them. 
Um, and so you have to kind of keep your mind open to different possibilities. But this is clearly what happens. is So the gametes segregate in equal proportions. Okay. When the two different alleles are present, you only saw one trait. So that's the one we're going to call the dominant allele. And he confirmed that by allowing that F2 generation to self-cross. And then you see in the F3 that recessive phenotype comes back again. Okay. All right. So just kind of walking through in a diagram then. So are these two, we're still with a monohybrid cross. Is this a, is this a correct Mendelian cross with true breeding parent? Yes. Okay. So you only have one type of gamete that can form here, the big R, and one type of gamete here, the small r allele. So then you have fertilization. In the F1, you get all heterozygotes. They show all the dominant trait, but now they can create two different gametes. 50% are big R, 50% are small r. Even though they're self-crossing, it's the equivalent of a a more typical animal male female crossing. We go to the F2 generation and we get one fourth. And just by looking at all the possibilities, big R with big R, so we one fourth of the time we are homozygous dominant. Two different ways to get the heterozygote, so it's one fourth plus one fourth is one half, and then one fourth of the homozygous recessive. And you can see that by now doing a self-fertilization with the one with the recessive trait. And what are you going to see after that? What has he created there? Another true breeding parent because it's only going to show the recessive trait. And that's what you see here. Okay. So this is kind of leading us up to that typical little Punnett square. And what I want to do is get to the point where you'll be able to do those in your head and then expand it out to multiple loci. Oh, okay, here's another. Let's, let's try it. So if both parents are homozygous for the dominant allele of a specific gene, then 100% of the offspring will be, what, for the dominant allele. No, I should be doing what? Oh, I got to switch it back. All right. I see. I thought it was defaulting back. Never mind. Here we go. Now let's try it. I just wanted to see if you were paying attention. All right. Yeah, we'll just go to 45 seconds, pretty easy one. All right. Any obvious answer is okay. Oh, another one. Yes, Diana likes doing these. Okay. All right. This might be one of those so-called tricky questions, but you got to read carefully. The single biggest mistake students make on the exams is they don't read carefully. And don't stop reading through the choices when you think you found the correct answer. Go through all of them. Uh, let's see.
good. Most of you are getting it right. Okay. I'll go to minute 20. I think everybody should be in by now. Okay. The answer is? Yes. They're randomly cut off? Uh, I think I'd go talk to the manufacturer. I'm sorry, I'm not going, yes, I do mean to be sarcastic, but um, again, if you got to keep in mind each of these questions is just a tiny little fraction of a point, so don't, um, I'm sorry, if what? No, you just missed the participation points, but I, it, no, it's not the whole thing. It's just way too, kind of look around you. <laughs> And everybody is going to have their eye clickers failing. So, yeah, put in the batteries, make sure that the system's working. Um, but I know that the technology is not perfect. Okay, I think the second majority were B. Why isn't it B? What is different? Different loci tells you what? But different loci are different genes. All right? We're only talking about a single gene. If you're talking about different loci, you're talking about different genes. Okay, so it's it's the detail of what these definitions mean. Okay, so as I said, Mendel did these studies and came to these conclusions long before basically the chromosome theory of inheritance was worked out. It was decades before, and Walter Sutton worked this out in the early 1900s, about 40 years after Mendel published his work on his chromosome theory of inheritance, which he was doing this by looking at using insects as a model system because they typically have very few chromosomes and so that you could really visualize their chromosomes under the light microscope. And what he showed that was homologous pairs of chromosomes consist of one maternal and one paternal <coughs> chromosome. And then when he looked at the gametes, only one of those chromosomes from each pair were present in the gametes. So this segregation of the homologous chromosomes must have been what Mendel was looking at. And so it was able to relate Mendel's observation that there must be two alleles for each gene genetic factor to the fact that one must be present on each of these homologous chromosomes. One copy of each homologous chromosome goes into the gamete, and then they reunite again at fertilization. So it linked chromosome behavior to Mendel's observation. So to kind of see it in a cartoon form, so here's, so this is a single, just to be clear, so this is a single genetic locus. It's the same address on the two chromosomes. So we're just talking about the R gene or the R locus. We have two alleles. Is this one homozygous or heterozygous? Heterozygous, okay. Now this is in G1. We go through S phase, so we have duplication. So we have two chromosomes here. How many chromosomes do we have here? Still two, but there's really four DNA molecules. So these are the two sister chromatids held together at the centromere. Now this one happens to show crossing over a genetic recombination. So coming to the left, there's going to be no crossing over or we had crossing over between the chromosomes going to the right. Let's just follow it through on here and then I'll make one comment about that. So now we're coming up to, we have metaphase, we go through anaphase, and we have our two cells. So now the centromeres didn't split. You have the sister chromatids for each homologous pair, but now there's actually just one allele in each of these pre gametes. How many N is this cell? Let's go up here. So this was how many N? There's two N, four N, still four N. How about here? Two cells with two N. 
So this is the end of meiosis one. Meiosis two is essentially a mitosis. And now you have the four one end cells. So these are the four gametes. They could be egg, they could be sperm. 50% have the big R allele, 50% have the small R allele. Okay? Now, what happens if you have genetic recombination? So you have crossing over. So now you have the big R allele here and the small R allele here. You go through, we'll go through all this in some detail later on. Is this outcome different? With just with respect, okay, I'll see, I see a question in a minute. Just with respect to the R gene, it's still 50% are big R and 50% are small R. So when you're talking about recombination, if you're only looking at one gene, you can't see it. It happened, but you can't see it in your experiment. Okay? Yes? Yes and no. Generally, it is random. So when we talk about genetic mapping based on genetic crossing over, it's assumed that it's a completely random process. Now that we do genetics at the molecular level and sequence the genomes, when you look at the physical map, which is actually the DNA sequence, and you compare it to the genetic map that was worked out by genetic recombination, you see some compression and expansion, which tells you that recombination is not completely random. So, for instance, around the centromere, uh, there's actually some sequences to prevent crossing over close to the centromere. So genes that are close to the centromere, by classical genetic mapping, will appear to be closer than they truly are. Um, and when the genes are far apart on the same chromosome, they actually will behave as though they're independently assorting. But to the first general approximation, crossing over is random. Okay. So to just do this with the Punnett squares, you've seen it. As I said, I'm trying to take you through this, but I want to see if I can show you how to streamline your thinking on this. Okay, so the Punnett square, everybody's familiar with this, a simple method to predict the outcomes here. So we'll talk, we'll work with a plant. Now we'll just change traits. We'll have tall plants indicated by a large T. That'll be the dominant trait. Short plants, small T. So now we're going to cross a heterozygote to a short homozygote. Is that, a, is that a traditional Mendelian cross? Okay, so one of the things I want to point out is, yeah, we're going to have all these ratios, 3 to 1 and 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 and such. Don't just memorize those ratios because they only apply when the cross is set up exactly in the right way following the way Mendel would have done it. So rather, look at each problem as we go through it. So here we're going with a heterozygote cross to this short homozygous recessive parent. Uh, this is, we're not going to talk about it a lot at this point, but just to put it in there, this is called a back cross. A back cross means anytime you have an individual from the F1 generation who's now going to be mated to an individual who has one of the parental genotypes, so you're going back to the previous generation. All right. So if we do this, um, we can do this to actually also determine the genotype of these parents. And I'll show you what we mean by this in a minute. So if this is a heterozygote, we have two different types of, two different alleles, right? So you got half the gametes are big T, half the gametes are small T. Only one type of gamete coming from the short one. All right. So you draw out your Punnett square. You put the alleles across the top, the alleles down the side, so it's only, a, it's only four boxes because there's only two possible, two alleles here and two alleles here. You can fill in the genotypes, you can fill in the phenotypes, and you're ready to go. And in this, type, this case, you see the genotypic ratio is one to one, in other words, 50% homozygous, um, hetero, I'm sorry, 50% heterozygotes, 50% homozygous recessive. 
The phenotypic ratio is also one to one. Not a traditional Mendelian cross, but follows the same rules. So, that's simple. But we're going to make things a little more complicated and to make it easier to think about it, just want to talk to you about two simple probability rules. The first is probably the easier to understand, the multiplication rule. And that is the probability of two or more independent events occurring is to simply multiply the probabilities of each event. So if the outcome of the first event has no influence on the outcome of the second event, then you multiply them together. The key word when you're reading about this is going to be and. So in this example, the probability of rolling one four and a second four, those are independent events. The rolling of the die the first time should not affect the second outcome. So you multiply them together as probability is one sixth of rolling a four the first time, one sixth of rolling a second time, or one thirty six for rolling both of them in succession. Okay. Straightforward? Okay. The one that's maybe not as easy to see is the addition rule. This is the probability of one or more events happening that are mutually exclusive. That is, if one happens, the other one can't happen. Here are the key words you're looking for are either and or. So the probability of rolling either a three or a four, since those are mutually exclusive. If you roll a three, you can't have a four, and if you roll a four, you can't have a three. Then you add them. One six and one six is one third. Okay. We're going to use these two rules to be able to bypass drawing all of these Punnett squares. Uh, maybe another way, since this one's not quite, I think, as, ob as intuitive as the other one, is you can do this, let's say, with the uh, sex of an unborn child. So you have a friend or you, you're pregnant, you don't know what the sex of the baby is. What's the probability that's a boy? One half. What's the probability of a girl? What's the probability it's one of those two? One half. What's the probability it's either a boy or a girl? One. So you add one half and one half, and you get one. Because they're mutually exclusive. All right. Although we'll talk about some genetics later on where they're not male and female start to get a little confusing. Most of the time. Right. In this case, right. You, right. This is this is they're mutually exclusive. You can't if you're one, you can't be the other. Then you use the addition rule. Okay. So let's just apply it in a simple way. But instead of drawing out this Punnett square, we'll just look at it with these very simple math. And the idea is that once you do a few of these monohybrid crosses in your head, you can see this without having to draw it out and taking time to do that, since you're only going to have about two minutes per question on the exam anyway. So we do self-fertilization of the F1 generation, so it's a heterozygote cross to a heterozygote. All right. Well, in the, whatever progeny come out of this, the probability of Getting the big T allele is from the first parent is what? One half. Probability of getting the big T allele from the second parent is one half. So what the probability that in the F1 you're going to be homozygous dominant is simply one half times one half. The allele that you get from one parent is independent of the allele that you get with the other and is simply one fourth. Well, that's what you would see in the upper. If you drew it in the usual way, that's what you'd see in the upper left corner of your Punnett square. So we can look at it. So here's a cross of the two heterozygotes. To get this genotype, it was just what we just did, one half times one half is one fourth. The phenotype is tall. For the heterozygotes, it's still going to be one half for big T, and it's one half for the small T. So in each of these cases, getting each of these genotypes is one fourth. Just make sure you notice that with the heterozygote, there's two different ways to get that. 
That's where your addition rule is going to come in. Okay. So here's where you'd apply the addition rule. So if you said, what's the probability of obtaining a tall plant? Well, out of four possible combinations, there were three. If it's tall, it can't be short, so we're going to be adding them. One-fourth plus one-fourth plus one-fourth is three-quarters. Three-quarters tall, one-quarter short. That gives you that phenotypic ratio of three to one. So you can do all of this without drawing, having to draw a single planet square. All right. Now, it sounds like it's a whole lot easier just to draw the little box, okay? And for a monohybrid cross, that's probably true. But as we start adding more genes in, things get a lot more complicated, and you're going to spend way too much time drawing pictures, and there's a much easier way to go through it, and we can begin to do that by looking at two genes now. We're in a, in a minute. So any questions at this point? Okay. Before we go into that dihybrid cross, I want to talk about a test cross. So I talked about a back cross. Don't let the terms, they're different. So the back cross means you're taking an individual from the F1 or F2, whatever generation, and crossing them to an individual with a genotype from the previous generation. A test cross is just what its name says. We're going to use this to determine the, the genotype of an individual with the dominant trait. Because it can either be homozygous dominant or it can be a heterozygous. So we're going to take the individual of an unknown genotype and cross it to an individual who's homozygous recessive, who has, who has the recessive phenotype. Why would we want to do that? If it's a recessive phenotype, do we know the genotype? Yes. So we're going to be crossing an unknown against the known genotype. All right, so here's an example. We have a tall plant crossed with a short plant. In this particular case, we're just identifying that it is a heterozygote. Now, this is an example of both a test cross and a back cross. Everybody see why? Okay. So here's the Punnett square, and you get the one-to-one -one phenotypic ratio, tall and short. All right. But now, so how do you know this was a heterozygote? Because you actually got short plants that have appeared out of that. All right. So let's make this a, let's do this as a clicker question. What happens if this tall plant was actually a homozygous dominant? What percentage of that F1 are going to be tall if the plant is homozygous dominant? Okay, we got, now we're going to do numbers. Okay, so first, you can do it either way. You can do it as a percentage, you can do it as fractions. Well, I guess, on this one, you better do it as a percentage. If, if, if I do the alphanumeric, then you can do fractions. This one you can do as a percentage. We're still on the learning curve for what we can do with these things. It's the way I word the question. All right, I'll go to a minute and a half. So what's the percentage? 
So it's a test cross because we've got an individual, this tall plant, we don't know if it's homozygous dominant or heterozygous. We make a cross against an individual whose phenotype tells you what the genotype is. So the genotype is known, and then you look at the outcome. And in this case, if 100% were tall plants, then that means all the progeny are heterozygotes. Is this a Mendelian cross? Yes, these are true breeding parents. So I could ask three or four different questions on the same problem. But I won't. Those are too easy. But I should. <laughs> oh, here's another easy one. I got to talk to Diane about this. All right. Uh, alternate forms of a gene. You must throw these in just to give you a little bit of a breather. <laughs> yeah. Especially now since it's all molecular. Chromosomal locations are becoming less important. Human genome is still mapped out. The software genome, we'll get into these things about polytene chromosomes. They have this very discrete banding pattern, and all the genes were mapped to individual bands. So the locus was based on the closest band. But now that the whole all molecularly mapped, you really don't use that too much anymore. So the term locus is probably sort of beginning to get phased out of use just as the technology changes. Okay. So this answer is obviously... Okay. Again, if you're struggling with that one, I don't know, you might want some career counseling. All right. Let's try this one. All right, let's go back to multiple choice. Okay. So individual one has is tall, is test crossed, half of the offspring produced have the tall phenotype and half have the short phenotype. What are the genotype of the what were the genotypes of the individuals, the parents, that were used in this cross? Okay. About 65% are going in the right direction. Let's see. I'll go to a minute and 15 on this one. Oops, sorry. Out there a minute, a few seconds early. Okay, so what's the answer? All right. So that's what we just did. All right. But you start thinking about these sort of things. Okay, so any questions on monohybrid crosses before we move on? All right. Before we move on towards the dihybrid and pentahybrid crosses. A little bit of jargon here. So as some genetic conventions that are used. Um, don't shoot me, I'm just report the news. Not all of these conventions are consistent. So there is some variation from one species to another. But generally, what you find is the name of the gene will be depicted by one to three letters. That's generally there. And here's a point that can get a little bit confusing. If you're talking about the gene, if you're talking about the locus, if you're talking about the DNA sequence, then you use italics. All right. For instance, we work on a gene called MSR. If, you talk, if I'm talking about the gene, then MSR is an italics. It codes for the MSR protein. If I'm talking about the product of the gene, then you use standard letters. But you use italics when you're specifically referring to the gene. 
All right. Lower case is typically used for recessive alleles and uppercase for dominant alleles, although a lot of times just the first letter will be there. So this example comes from Drosophila, the SXL gene. Um, anybody know what this is? Although you may be indicating that you've taken this class before. <laughs> so they're not going to, yeah, they know what it is, they're not going to tell you. All right, so this stands for sex lethal. It's, um, which must be what dating in the 21st century must be like. But it actually comes from Drosophila, so it's part of the sexual differentiation genes. Uh, there's some other ones called transformer because the mutation actually transforms females into males, these sorts of things. But I'm just using this as an example. We'll come back to sex lethal later on when we talk about uh, intron and exon splicing. There can also be multiple alleles. So capital letters and lowercase letters work well if you only have two alleles, as Mendel did. But for many of these genes, there's multiple alleles. So then the easiest thing to do is to start working with superscripts or subscripts. So a gene we'll talk about next time is the white allele from Drosophila, which codes for the eye color. But there's many different alleles of it. This one has this A superscript happens to be the apricot allele. So the original mutation gave a white eye color. This was a different mutation that has some pigmentation, so it has an apricot color. So when you have multiple alleles of a gene, you'll often see most of the time it'll use a superscript instead of subscripts. All right. As you should know, the wild type is the allele most commonly found out in the world, out in the wild. So if I went to a fruit stand and collected flies from the bananas or wherever they happen to be, most likely they're going to have red eyes. So red eyes are the wild type eye color for fruit flies. And many times that's just indicated with a superscript of a plus. So W plus indicates the wild type allele of the W gene. Okay. But as I said, there's some specialized variations that you just have to learn depending on the particular organism you're working with. Could be E. coli, yeast, um, zebrafish, mice, C. elegans. There's so many model systems now. Here's what might be a potentially confusing point. In this nomenclature that they've used, if you look at it for the Mendelian plant, for these Mendelian experiments, don't follow the normal convention. We've used big T to indicate tall plants, but usually the name of the gene is based on the mutant phenotype because that's how you found it, the mutation in some gene. Okay, So if I use this red eye color from Drosophila, so the wild type is red, but the first genetic mutant of Drosophila that was found, it was a spontaneous mutation that occurred in Morgan's lab while his students were working with the flies, actually gave a mutant eye color of white. Now, you might think that white would encode the pigment that gives the AI the red color. It actually encodes a gene. It actually encodes a protein required to deposit the pigment. But it gave it a white eye. So the gene that's responsible for the red eyes was called the white locus because it's based on the phenotype of the mutant. And it's been, so it uses a small w. So w plus flies have what color eyes? They're going to have red. All right. Okay. So we'll see more of those conventions as we kind of get more into the Drosophila genetics once we leave Mendel's work today. All right. So we also did the dihybrid crosses. And you've done this before, I know, in general genetics or high school and such. So we'll go through that, but also show you how you can use these probability rules to do this in a much, now the Punnett square is going to get more complicated. Let's do this in a faster, simpler, more straightforward, and less error prone way. All right. So then he started looking at crosses involving two traits. Now, what's absolutely critical to this whole discussion is that these are independent events. 
He was looking at traits that are controlled by genes on different chromosomes. Had the gene, if he was looking, here he, we're going to talk about seed color and seed shape. If the two genes that control those two traits were on the same chromosome and fairly close together, he would have gotten completely different results. He wouldn't have been able to interpret them. It's what is called gene linkage. Now, here's an interesting thing. Was Mendel lucky, or did he just selectively omit some data? Now that we know more about the genetics of pea plants, two of the genes that are on the chromos that two of the traits are controlled by genes that are on the same chromosome. But as we'll talk about in more detail when we get to genetic recombination, they are far enough apart that they will genetically behave as though they are on separate chromosomes. So that's okay. There are two genes, and I don't remember which ones they are, that actually are close enough together on the same chromosome, he should have seen gene linkage. If you look in his original paper, he didn't do that cross. So was he just lucky and didn't happen to do that cross? Or did he do that cross and get results that made no sense compared to everything else he had, and he just kind of overlooked it? All right. So those are some of the reasons why there's been a number of papers over the years of saying that Mendel's data was too good. All right. So we're going to make the assumption through all of this that these are genes are on different chromosomes, and therefore they are fully and independently assorting, and that's why we can apply those probability rules. Okay. So he's going to start out. He's going to cross a true breeding plant. In this case, it's true breeding for round yellow seeds, so two traits. And then wrinkled green seeds. So he's got the dom two dominant traits and the two recessive traits. Does the crosses just like we've done before. The F1 still shows you the two dominant traits. Nothing changed there. Self-fertilizes the F1, looks at the F2, and he gets four different phenotypes. All right. So here's the genotypes. So he's homozygous for the two dominant traits, homozygous for the two recessive traits, Everybody see why there's only one type of gamete here? Okay, and only one here. So when you have fertilization in the F1, you have the double heterozygote. They both show both dominant traits. Now how many gametes can you get out? You have four different ones. All right, so the number of gametes that you can get is 2 to the n, where n is the number of genes you're looking at. If we're dealing with three genes, there would be eight gametes. Okay? So we just have the two to the, two to the second, or four traits here. All right. So he gets four possible gametes. So there's 16 possible com genotypes out of the F2. And we'll go through this in a second, not one by one. But he's going to find nine that have both dominant traits, three that have one dominant, one recessive trait, Three that have the other dominant and recessive traits reversed, and one out of the 16 that'll have both recessive traits. If you want to do this by a Punnett square, now you have four different gametes, so you got a four by four matrix. So you got to draw out all those gametes, draw out these gametes, put in all the different genotypes. They haven't even filled in the phenotypes yet, but what you see is this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio, which should sound familiar probably from general biology, right? And you only get that if you set that cross up exactly that way, okay? If I don't do use true breeding parents, then the outcome is a little different. I'll show you an example. All right. Um, I usually fall asleep about halfway through drawing this thing, and then I make mistakes and everything else. There's got to be an easier way to do this. Okay, so now what we're really looking at is this independent assortment, all right? So as I said, this is only going to apply when these genes are on different chromosomes. Uh, let's see. And this is what I was talking about before, so this independent assortment. 
two different genes. This is observed by Mendel, and it's again, it's completely consistent with what the chromosomes do in meiosis. All right. So here's the key to this. If these traits are independently assorted, these genes are on different chromosomes, then take the dihybrid cross and break it up into two monohybrid crosses, and they're independent events, so just multiply the probability. You can do the monohybrid crosses in your head, just multiply them together, and you're done. Okay, so consider each trait individually, then just use the multiplication rule. So here's an example. Here's what we're talking about. So we got the, the two heterozygotes. All right. First of all, just consider shape. So R is for the round for the shape. As a monohybrid cross, this little line dash here indicates it can either be the dominant allele or the recessive allele. If we just set up these crosses, do a, put the Punnett square together in your head. When you do two heterozygotes, you know that three quarters are going to be heterozygotes, and one quarter is going to be, I'm sorry, not three quarters are going to have the round phenotype. So they're either going to be homozygous dominant or the heterozygote, and one fourth are going to be homozygous recessive. Then look at the seed color. You do the same thing. Since they're independent events, we just multiply the probabilities together. All right, so we have three quarters are round, three quarters are yellow. Multiply them together, nine sixteenths are round and yellow. But now one fourth are going to be green, homozygous recessive. So three fourths by one fourth gives you three sixteenths. Work your way through this, and there's your nine to three to three to one ratio. Exactly the same results you'd get from drawing out the 16 boxes on a Punnett square. You should be able to do that in a fraction of the time and less likely to make a mistake. Okay, it's just two monohybrid crosses. Their probabilities multiply together. All right. Here's another one. Is this a test cross? Yeah. Because it's homozygous recessive, but for two traits. So as long as it's homozygous recessive, for all the traits you're looking at, this would be a test cross. Apply exactly the same thing. All right. Except here, how many different gametes can you get? Well, it's okay. I'll make it too. Let's not go there. All right. Let's look at just the round color. So it would be a heterozygote across the homozygous recessive. Half are going to be round. Half are going to be wrinkled, right? That's what your Punnett square would tell you. Do the same thing with the color. Half yellow, half green. Multiply the two together, and you get one-fourth of each of those phenotypes. Exactly what you get out of the dihybrid cross on its square, but you don't have to draw it. Yes? Uh, let's see. I don't... You couldn't really do it because you don't know how this one is derived. You'd have to know what the previous... You can't really do a back cross unless you know what the previous generation was. But it is... You have to see why it's a test cross. Okay. I'd have to know what the previous generation was. Um, for instance, if I took one of these and let's say back and crossed it to the homozygous recessive for both traits, then it would be a back cross because it's the genotype of an individual from the previous generation. Okay. So let's see if you can actually do this. So this would be a, this this is probably pretty this is pretty close to a question that would be on the exam. And I'm going to set this for alphanumeric, so you should be able to enter these as fractions if that's easier to do. Or you can do them as decimal points if you want to do it on a calculator. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, the first answer. Yeah. But at least to me, in my mind, these are the kind of problems you want to work through so that you can do these very quickly when it comes exam time. You don't want to waste 20 minutes on this question. You can add, I think if you can enter it as a fraction or isn't it, do I have it set right? So you can enter it as either a fraction or a number. You can do it as a decimal or a fraction. Yes? Just put the number, all it needs is a number. Yeah. Yeah, you can put in three quarters, or if you put in 0. 0.5, I know it's 50%. Yeah. I assume you could just put in a number. Do you have a, does it have a backslash? God, increasing limitations. All right. That's what I said. I'm learning. Well, just, you know, er, plug it into your neighbor's calculator or whatever and give me the decimal point. I, I didn't realize you didn't have a full keyboard. At least when I look at the answers, I can see how creative you are. There's no decimal either? I was going to say, oh, you can enter new numbers, but you can't enter decimals? That's pretty useless. I'm sorry, and what? Oh. I'm sorry, what? Okay, can you do All right, um, are you talking about for a fraction or decimal? All right, let's try this. If you want to do it as a fraction, you, know, you said there's a dash on there, so if you want to do three quarters, just put three dash four. I'll interpret that dash as a slash. And if you put in, you know, if it's one eighth, if you put in zero dash one two five, I'll know it's zero point one two five. Let's see how that works. Um, yes. Apparently, if you put zero first, then you can get the <coughs> Oh, I'm being told yeah. if you put the zero in first, it'll show yeah. the decimal. Yeah. Okay. Try that. By the end of the semester, we should be able to figure out how these things work, at least before clicker three comes out. All right, I'll go to five minutes on this one. These clickers seem to have lots of unintended consequences. Five seconds. Wait, wait, wait. 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 All right. I'll give you five and a half minutes. Well, it's all multiple choice. We did this on the exam. Good God, we'd be here till the next morning. I would wonder sometimes if instead of forcing those last few students to turn their exam, I just left them, but they'd still be there the next morning. No, I can do it. All 
All right. No, we're pretty close. Although it made me think about that. I know everybody's always, I'm just digressing here, but always wondered about those 10 students who always, in a class this size, those 10 students who always finish their exam in 15 minutes. You ever wondered about how smart they really are? And, well, for, just for fun, we, we marked those one time. I checked them out. Uh, out of those ten, first 10 that came in, there was one passing grade. All the others were failed. So they're just ones you just give up. They're not really the super smart. Okay, back to what we're supposed to be doing. So what's the answer after all of this? 1-8. Okay. What? Okay. So here's, the G, here's what you... So the first is read the question and extract the information you need. Here's the genotype of one parent, and there's the genotype of the other, and you're just asking what's the probability that you get this genotype from the crosses. Well, the, if the first one, as far as T is concerned, is that a, is that, that's the two heterozygous crossing, right? So to be homozygous dominant would be one fourth. Oh, I did? Well, they're both there. Are they there? Yeah. Whatever. Okay. So the probability of being homozygous dominant is going to be one fourth. Or one, uh, one fourth. Yeah. Okay, I did get it backwards in that, that damn secretarial school again. Okay, and then being homozygous recessive would be one half. So it's just one fourth times one half, one eighth. All right. Let's see if. Huh, let's try it again. All right. Now that you know how to use the clickers, which one should I set it on? Yeah. The same as last time, the, the alphanumeric? Okay. Let's see if we can do this in less than five minutes. Okay, so now in this one you have to pay attention to the genotype and the phenotype. In some ways, yeah. This is, this, these two are pretty close to. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Very soon, I'll put up some sample questions so you can see how how just twisted my mind really is. But.
Okay, I'll go to three and a half minutes on this one. It's getting faster. Okay, what's the answer? One eighth again. All right. Extract from the question the information. So the progeny you're looking for actually have the two recessive traits, right? So they're going to have, so the short progeny of white flowers are going to have a genotype homozygous recessive for T and homozygous recessive for P. Okay, so if you just so here's the two genotypes. So if we look at just T, the probability of being homozygous recessive is, is one fourth or 25 percent, and being homozygous recessive for P, P. So it's just one half times one fourth again, or one eighth. Okay. The answers to all these questions will not be one eighth. <laughs> okay, don't write that down. When in doubt, just one eighth. Okay. So, let's say you want to look at five different genes. Take this into a pentahybrid cross. So we got two parents who are heterozygous at all at five loci. Genes A, B, C, D, and E. What is the probability that their child will be homozygous recessive for all five genes? Now, you can draw the Punnett square, all right? But it's 2 to the 5th, or a matrix of 32 by 32 with 1,024 boxes in it. And I'm way too lazy to do that. So let's just treat this as five monohybrid crosses, all right? So each parent's heterozygous at each of the loci. So the probability that the child will be homozygous recessive at each gene is going to be what? Simply one fourth. Five loci, one fourth times five, or one out if you've drawn out all that huge punnett square, one box out of the thousand and twenty-four. So there's only one chance in the thousand and twenty-four of the child will be homozygous recessive at all five loci. Okay. So let's make it a little bit different. What's the probability that the genotype of the child will be this? All right? It's not as complicated as it looks. All right? They're crossing heterozygotes. So a little Punnett square in your head. Two heterozygotes. Probability of being a heterozygote. One half. Homozygous dominant. One fourth. Uh, heterozygote. One half. Homozygous recessive. One fourth. Homozygous dominant, one fourth. Multiply those out, one out of 256. Okay. Yes? Oh, no, it was from the one before. They're, they're both heterozygotes. Yeah, they're both, yeah, you have to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, if, I mean, if I, if I told you what to do, without telling you the genotype of the parent, it's one of those not enough information provided, okay? All right, since you've gotten really fast at this, let's do this one. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do this one. All right, one minute. I'm a good negotiator. I'm sorry, what? The decimal answer is weird. Oh. 
Okay, we'll talk about it in a minute. Maybe I... It's possible I could have made a mistake. It's never happened before. But... <laughs> oh, never, mind. never mind. Okay. 58, 59, 60. Oh, I said one minute. You guys are still working on this? 63. Because you guys are going to be mad at me when you see the answer. Huh? No, no. You want to do it again? All right. All right, let's try one more minute. You said the dash comes right? Yeah, when I look at the answers, I'll... So, like, You're saying one... Yeah, I'll interpret that as one out of two different Okay. Like I said, it, it shows me all the different creative ways that you've entered the data. I'm sorry, this is, I'm tra this is a second question. So you're getting two shots at it. Same question, but I'm giving you two tries. If you had it right the first time, you had it right the second time. If you had it wrong, wrong the first time, yeah, you probably got it wrong the second time, too. Okay. Okay. Four, three, two... No, yeah, come on. All right, what's the answer? Exactly. That's, here's the answer over here. Look at the problem. Think it through. If one's a heterozygote and the other's homozygous dominant, you can't have a child who's homozygous recessive. And that's one of, you can't get a child that's homozygous for D. So the answer is zero. Yes? Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I, I said one minute, but it's okay. I'm going to get, you guys, you know, on some of these questions, I'll just give you credit for it because I knew you were going to screw it up. <laughs> no. All right. Yeah, whatever. It's all a learning process. The idea is look at the problem, read through the problem, and extract out the information. And just wanted to show you an example where you can go through all of this, but as you did, you can immediately see there's no... Okay. All right. Why did I do this? Because of a demented fifth grade teacher that I had. All right. You guys, did you have to learn multiplication tables and such, or did you just always did everything on calculators? Okay, since I came from the Stone Age when we were still chiseling on tablets and this sort of thing, my fifth grade teacher was doing multiplication, and he starts at one of this thing called a chalkboard. It was kind of like this, but he had to use chalk. He starts writing numbers, five times six times seven times eight times whatever, and keeps going all the way down the board, and we're all trying to go through, and at the end he wrote times zero. <laughs> I remembered that after all these years. Look at the whole problem first. There may be a simple solution to it. Okay? All right. Last couple of comments. The role of chance. When we play these probability games, these probabilities only apply if we can look at an infinite number of situations. All right? If I flip a coin ten times, It'll come up heads five times on average. But things can be skewed one way or the other if the sample size is too small. So there's several types of probabilistic studies that we can apply to this. An old one that's been around is called the chi-square. All of these are really intended to just ask the question, what's the probability that the result you're seeing is simply due to chance and isn't really the biological system you're looking at? And in general, that's the so-called p-value. Most of the time, scientists accept that if p is 5% or less, then you're looking at something that is biologically significant. P-value is greater than 5%. Yeah, you may simply be looking at random chance. 
we're not going to do go into any of the statistics because I'm trying to teach this course from a mechanistic point of view and also the fact that I can't let you use calculators and such on the exams. You can't do chi-squares and such without them. But just to be aware of it. Um, also, uh, so as I said, we're not going to do that. So we'll wrap up with this final clicker question. And that's all we're going to do for today. On Wednesday, we'll move into Chapter 4, which I think is uh, sex-linked inheritance. And then we'll start talking about flies. Okay. So this needs to be set on, I guess, same thing. There we go. Okay, so that's the uh, last clicker question for today. As I said, we, I try to target 22. Um, as soon as you answer this one, we're done, or you can uh, ask me questions.